Remember when Polygon showed off that footage of Doom earlier this year and had people laughing at how bad the guy was playing, shooting at the floor and barely making any mark? It was embarrassing for Polygon, and then they went on the defensive by attacking their readers and overall throwing a tantrum. You know, exactly how Polygon would respond to any criticism or negativity thrown their way instead of owing up to it. In the video, you could tell that the guy was using a controller and obviously wasn't used to it for first-person controls. And if they said that from the start or afterwards, it would have been over and done with a lot more more quickly. But it did bring up an interesting point. What should be a game reviewer's qualifications? How skilled are they? How long do they have to play? And so on and so forth. We'll often hear game critics saying that you don't need to be skilled in playing games in order to critique them, saying that it's a plus and it gets potential gamers into the hobby. Basically using that I don't know what art is but I know what I like type of logic, which works on a rudimentary level when it comes to games. Because games are a form of art and therefore a subjective medium. It says that any schlub with an internet connection can review games, and this channel is proof of it. Niche Gamer wrote an article saying that yes, you do need to be skilled at games, making a comparison that you wouldn't want an untrained mechanic working on your car. The article did make some good points, but had a very Get Lost Scrubs type of feel to it, saying that gaming doesn't need the casual and softcore gamers to survive, saying that it makes more money than the music and movie industries before Angry Birds came around, using an example of how much money GTA 5 made, looking at the Call of Duty series, looking at launch events, they have more people there than there are lines for the next Marvel movie, and that the hardcore base keeps it financially healthy. And those are just some excerpts from the article. However, yes, Gaming does need softcore players to survive. The perfect example is how World of Warcraft changed. The Wrath of the Lich King expansion appealed to everyone. Anyone could get good gear and experience all the content their subscription entitled them to. Then the small yet vocal hardcore base took to the forums, saying that you don't deserve gear if you don't raid. So when Cataclysm came out, Blizzard made it closer to the vanilla and Burning Crusade days, and that's when subscribers started to drop. Subscribers continued to drop through Miss of Pandaria and plummeted during Warlords of Draenor because of their decision to include stupid Facebook games in the garrisons to try and bring back the casual players they alienated after Wrath of the Lich King. And using Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto V are bad examples because everyone of all skill levels buys them, so it's not just the hardcore gamers. But by now, you're probably thinking that I'm siding with the you don't need skill to review games. Quite the contrary, actually. I do think that you need skill to properly review them. I do not think that you need to be at super hardcore major league gaming levels though, but I do think that you should at least know what you're doing. I tend to admit when I'm not that good at a certain type of game. I've mentioned before that I'm not the greatest at first person shooters, and my reviews tend to show that I don't have the greatest aim. But as I brought up at the beginning when I said that Polygon showed off Doom 2016 and how they're shooting the floor and missing targets multiple times, and recently they showed off Sonic mania. They were jumping towards enemy fire with no rings, jumping on his spikes almost purposely, and overall showing a horrible lack of skill at a platform game. It reminds me of the time when Pokemon X and Y were coming out. A girl at GameStop who was a new hire had no idea what I was talking about. If you're going to be working in a field that only specializes in one thing, you need to know what that one thing is. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want an auto mechanic giving you a prostate exam, but also you shouldn't be holding a lack of skill against a game, which is usually easy to spot. Like, if you're dying a lot, you need to question if it's you or the game. But then there's letting that lack of skill overly praise it, which is harder to tell, but I still hold on to the idea that if you're having fun, does it really matter? However, there are people out there that should not be reviewing games and shouldn't be in any form of games journalism or media, which are people like Anita Sarkeesian or anyone from Fox News. People with journalistic degrees or degrees in useless fields like gender studies that have an agenda that they want to spread while having no interest in video games, wanting them changed to make themselves comfortable even though they'll never touch the medium. And that's kind of what's happening. We're getting people in games journalism that don't play games and they're reviewing them or critiquing them, and when they're called out on it, they flip their shit and go buttfuck nuts. Accusing their readers of being misogynistic man-children that live in their parents' basement, and they label all their readers that way, which results in them losing readers because they look less credible. Like when Glenn Beck, who's already not credible, said that Watch Dogs was teaching children how to hack into security systems. 
But then there are the game journalists that have been playing games their whole lives, but eventually seem to resent the medium. Stuff like that happens. They just get tired of reporting on games and talking about games. It's become their life and they've gotten tired of it. I've admitted that I've thought about quitting doing game reviews and sometimes that thought creeps back into my mind. Which is why I switched reviews to a bi-weekly basis and added in these rants to supplement the gap. It gives me a break and time to relax. But writers for gaming websites don't really have that luxury. They have to keep writing, they have to keep scouring the internet and sending emails to companies and all that. I can imagine that gets tiresome to the point of resentment. And for those that say they should find work elsewhere, that's easier said than done. Sure, they can move away and go independent like Jim Sterling by setting up a crowdfunding thing through Patreon. However, not everyone can do this. Kotaku and Polygon's writers can't do this because they're more akin to traditional journalism. Jim Sterling is probably a really good example because he has, in essence, name brand recognition. He's known for the Jimquisition. Yahtzee is known for zero punctuation. Doug Walker is known for the Nostalgia Critic. James Rolfe has the angry video game nerd and you get the point by now. That's what they're known for so they can be independent without help from a company like Kotaku or Polygon. So a lot of game journalists have essentially become burnt out. You can tell because of how much non gaming related news is popping up on those gaming websites. While they should get in new blood once in a while, it's rare because it's all corporate. They'd rather wait for someone to leave and hire a replacement than create a new position. So these gaming websites are just running their course until they're irrelevant. Much like how traditional media outlets have proved their obsolescence, as now it's all about sensationalism and tabloid news. But there's something else I wanted to bring up, which is the amount of time you need to play a game before someone can write a review. The original title of this rant was called Time Till Review, but I changed the title to encompass more of what should go into a review. Some people get mad when a reviewer admits that they don't complete a game. I personally don't think you need to beat a game before you can write a proper review of it, because the game isn't going to shift its playstyle every hour. It's going to stay the same for the entire ride. There might be some variations, but there'll be minor aspects. Rise of the Tomb Raider is going to stay a third-person action game. It's not going to suddenly become a real-time strategy after the halfway point. You have to understand that there are deadlines that reviewers have to face. When reviewing a game as a person's full-time job, they got a lot of time to put out a review in time. If they work for a company, then they have a deadline. If they're independent like a lot of YouTubers are, then they have all the time in the world. If they're a big-time YouTuber that makes videos for a living, then they can make many other types of videos for their viewers. These people can take time for life and whatnot. If something disrupts them, then it's not that much of a big deal, unless it's catastrophic. But everyday things that can take a few hours isn't that much of a disruption. Or they can pay people to take care of it if they rake in enough cash. However, for small-time YouTubers that have to work full-time jobs for a living, then time is even more precious, then those small disruptions are the worst. There's 168 hours in a week. If you have to work a regular job 40 hours a week and sleep 8 hours a day, that's 96 hours taken up, leaving 72 hours of free time. But then there's things that take up that free time, like house and car maintenance, other leisure activities like going to the movies or shopping for the necessities like food and clothes, and sometimes you just want to veg out and unwind and not do anything because you're kind of leading a double life at that point. Many people ask, why not just take more time or take a break, because that can spell death for a small channel. YouTube is a very volatile environment. Sometimes people can get a lot of hits and then the next day it's like the plug was pulled. So delaying video output can outright kill a channel, so time is really an important factor. And while I think that you don't need to beat a game or get 100% of the achievements, I do think that there is a minimum of which needs to be played. Now I don't mean how much time you've invested into it, I mean how much of the main game that you've completed, unless it's a game that doesn't actually end and keeps going. My personal minimum is at least half of the game's campaign. If it's a bad game, why torture myself, or if I get stuck at a really difficult part of the game? But if I do get stuck at a hard part, I delay the review and put something in its place. It's the reasons why Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep and Mega Man Legend reviews have been shelved. Because I'm stuck on a boss for both games. Also, if the game is boring, 50% is good enough, which is one of the reasons why I haven't reviewed Xenosaga, because that game, as I mentioned before, puts me to sleep. And of course, there's exceptions to my 50% rule, like for simple games that don't change that much, like my Burnout Revenge review last year. While I did play it before the game was stolen from me when it came out, I only played for about two hours for the review, or really bad games to where they're to the point of unplayable. If it's a game that I played a lot in the past, like Final Fantasy VII, then I think a couple hours is good enough, as I played the game to completion six times, and my opinion on it still hasn't changed. Granted, if my opinion did 
change, then I would have played it all the way through as I would have to reassess my opinion of it. On average, I would say I hit at least 85% of the campaign completion, especially nowadays with the reviews being bi-weekly. Sometimes people talk about using cheat codes during a review, and I'll admit that I've used a few but for certain occasions, like needing to show something off. Like in Sonic 2, there's that annoying pit in the Mystic Caves Act 2 where falling in with Supersonic is the most tormenting way ever. I used a debug code to get to it, and I used a level select code with Blood Rain to skip over a level in the beginning that had me chasing a monster that ate Rain's friend because I could barely see it. If I've used an invincibility code or infinite lives, I've played the game legitimately as if the code was disabled. I only did it to show off more of the game, and I've only done that with two or three games and that was many years ago. I don't think cheat codes are that harmful as long as it's used to get over a certain hurdle that you're having a hard time getting over. As long as you're not using codes for the whole time, I think it's okay. As long as you're using it to get over that one hurdle you're having an issue with. Because if that part gives you too much frustration, then it's possible that one difficult part could end up impacting a reviewer's opinion of the game. Recently, Catechrist reviewed the original Rayman and had used a cheat code to get past a certain part of the game. Something I won't fault him for, because I can understand getting stuck at a part of a game that's giving you a hard time. It's either use a cheat code or just end the review right there or change the review into a different game. So yeah, I think cheat codes are okay as long as it's used that one time to get over that small bump in the road. And then there's the use of emulators. Some will say that it's not the same as playing the original console. In some cases, yeah, it's not always the most perfect experience. When I reviewed Pokemon Snap, it had graphical glitches. However, older consoles are easier, like the NES and Sega Genesis. The original PlayStation is good to emulate on as well. The Sega Saturn is damn near impossible, although I heard recently it was cracked to make it a lot easier. And anything from the 6th generation and up, I've never tried and have no desire to. I rarely emulate a game to review now, mostly due to the fact that I don't need to anymore. The last time I did was for the Bubsy revisit on my 200th review. And while I have a Sega Genesis and NES, I lack the recording hardware for a system of its time. I would need a capture device that captures in standard definition as my current one only does HDMI and component for PlayStation 3. I'm not opposed to emulation for reviews of older games. I think that if you're starting out and don't have the equipment or just can't get the game in question at a reasonable price, then go ahead and emulate it. There seems to be this stigma that a game reviewer needs to have every console ever made, shelves filled with games, books about games, and figures from games with games or anime posters or wall scrolls, essentially every current nerd stereotype out there. If my room wasn't arranged in such a slapdash manner for comfort, you'd see the wall scrolls and figures as I would record from there as it's more interesting than the living room. And I think that if you like games and enjoy playing them with some decent skill, that's all you really need to be a game reviewer. But if you got a degree in journalism and don't like or want to talk about games, stay away from that sector of journalism because you're going to be doing some serious long-term damage to your credibility. Well, unless you want to work for TMZ, then go for it.